Welcome to part 5 of the ICO HF52 tube amplifier series. In parts 1 through 4, I stripped this horribly built 1957 amp down to its bare cadmium plated chassis and repainted it. In this episode, I'll rebuild the amp and see if I can get it to make beautiful music again. The ICO HF52 was a kit amp, so helping me along the way will be the original assembly manual. Similar to Heathkit, the manual is very good. It includes a thorough description of the amp's features and circuit design, along with specifications, operating and maintenance instructions, troubleshooting guide, parts list, schematic, and detailed illustrations. Here are the new parts. Here's the freshly painted chassis. Let's build! Those old miniature tube sockets really are delicate. Unfortunately, one of the pins in this one just broke right off. No real problem though, I pulled this other socket from my junk bin and we don't even need to replace the whole thing. Just pull one of the pins out, drop it in the broken socket, pull from the other side, and now I can continue the build. Step 14 of the wiring instructions asks us to install a 0.03 microfarad capacitor between one of the terminals of the power switch and this ground lug. Because the capacitor goes from line to ground, I'll use the safety capacitor. To learn more about safety capacitors and why you need to use one in a situation like this, please see my Dynaco SCA80Q Part 5 video. I'll leave a link in the description. I'm actually not going to follow Ico's instructions because the schematic has a much better idea. Instead of mounting the capacitor at the power switch, let's put it after the fuse. Let's go! <laughs>
Okay, great. We're at the final step of the wiring section and it's time to install the line cord. The original cord is still in great shape, so let's just clean it up a bit with some Armorall protectant. It is a nice looking plug, so it'd be a shame not to use it. For safety's sake though, let's mark the smooth side of the non-polarized plugged as the hot. And we'll use this side to connect to the fuse and the switch. The chassis only has a hole for a rubber grommet, not a strain relief bushing, and that just allows too much movement. For a firmer grip, I inserted a rubber strain relief into the grommet, inserted that into the chassis, fed the cable through, tied a knot, and soldered the cord to one of the accessory jacks. While I was in the neighborhood, I remembered that nearby I had wired the amp for the 117 volt winding on the primary. It was my intention to use that winding as Ico said it really should be fine for up to 124 volts, but I changed my mind and made the snap call to change the wiring to use the 125 volt tap. The voltages in my house range between 120 and 124, so that really is the better choice. Once that rewiring was done, I asked myself how I could make even more work for myself, and I realized that adding a thermistor would do the trick. So I undid the connection from the primary to the fuse that I had just made and slipped one in. Putting a thermistor here really will be a good idea as it'll give the amp a softer start and that'll be much gentler on the rectifier tube. And yeah, I've got a video about thermistors too. If you want to learn more about them, please see my other video, Restored Antique Radio, Will It Work? Link also in the description. Now, using a fuse holder as a terminal strip can be problematic as the spring-loaded prong tends to move around, and that's something we definitely don't want. So I secured the wires with a zip tie to stop any movement, and that worked just fine. You may recall from part one that somebody had dangerously installed a 15 amp fuse. Instead, let's now install this correct one, which comes in at a much lower 3 amps. The bias circuit of the amp was originally rectified by this selenium, but that was retired to the old parts bag. Instead, I use this 1N4007 diode, which is far less likely to catch fire. Silicon diodes do drop less voltage than a selenium rectifier though, so we now need to add a dropping resistor. My calculations and a little experimenting found that a 680 ohm 1 watt resistor was just right to bring the bias feed voltage to the negative 90 volts the schematic called for. To learn more about replacing seleniums and calculating the correct dropping resistors, you guessed it, please see my other video, How to Replace Selenium Rectifiers, link in the description. I tested the tubes that came with the amp and all were good except the 12 AT7s, which were a little weak. No problem, as instead I'm going to use these 12 AX7s, which the manual actually calls for. Let's install the tubes now. Before I fire up the amp, let's just review some of the work that was done. Here's our dropping resistor and diode, the line to ground safety capacitor, and the thermistor. Here you can see I found and marked the foil side of the capacitors. I added a clamp for the output transformer wires that was missing. And on all of the transformer wires, I protected and color coded the cloth wiring with shrink wrap. All AC wiring is twisted to reduce hum as called for in the manual. And the original PC1 and PC2 were used. These early integrated circuits contain an array of capacitors and resistors for the loudness and tone functions. The amp required four shielded cables and I used four conductor cable for all of them, even though some only required one or two. Unused conductors were trimmed off accordingly and clear heat shrink was used on the braids. The manual didn't call for it, but I soldered all ground points to the chassis, not just those for the multi-section CAN capacitors. And yes, I was able to find new multi-section capacitors in the correct values, and those were used to help keep things as original as possible. Okay, I've got the amp connected to a Variac, current limiter, and dummy load. Let's slowly power it up to see if we have any shorts. Seems okay. Let's try it now without the current limiter. Uh-oh, one of the output tubes is red plating. Ah, and there goes the rectifier. That sucks. It was a really nice Bugle Boy worth about $250. Ah. Okay, something's clearly wrong, and it appears to be this untrimmed resistor lead. When I installed the resistor, I neglected to trim it, and later soldered it into position, thinking it was one of the many bare wire jumpers used on the tube sockets like this one. Okay, I fixed the issue. Now let's get a new rectifier in there. Okay, much better, but this 6C4 tube is seriously microphonic. Let's replace it with this CBS tube I happen to have on hand. Much better. Okay, it's now time to bias the amp. Biasing is the process of adjusting the voltages on the grids of the output tubes so they turn on just enough. With too little bias, the tubes won't conduct. And with too much bias, the tubes will run beyond their rated power, leading to premature failure. 
To adjust the bias, the instructions ask us to first connect a voltage meter's negative probe to ground and the positive to the center tap of the bias control. Here's the bias control from the top of the chassis. Now I just adjust the control until I get a reading of negative 47 volts. For the next step, I'll insert two bare pieces of 14 gauge wire into the test sockets. This will allow me to more easily connect the meter probes. And now we just adjust the balance control for a reading of zero. Good. Now we detach one of the probes and connect it to the speaker common terminal and adjust the bias control for a reading of 0.65 volts. Great, now we just repeat the last two steps until we get a perfect reading on both. Done. Okay, let's get the bottom plate attached so we can actually hear how the amp sounds. As the bottom plate and chassis are now painted, I added this bolt and soldered it to a ground point and removed some paint on the corresponding point on the inner part of the bottom panel. This way there will be a nice ground connection and the plate can act as a hump shield as was intended. Let's just attach the bolts, the ground nut, and now let's fire up the amp. Looking for a shiny new gadget for your bench? Some good books on electronics, vintage hi-fi or old radios? Indispensable tools, cleaners or other products? Check out my new Amazon shop and help the channel. Lots of great products I actually own, use and recommend. Plus my thoughts on each one. Link in the description. To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.